Pacific Exchange was to begin with the bombardment of the air. Land forces were to be built up and re-equipped so that amphibious landing could be launched on the submarine of the working coastal tribes. Six, 1944, the German sentries patrolling the fortifications along the Normandy coast were confronted with a terrifying spectacle. In front of them was the mightiest armada that had ever sailed. Over 6,000 naval vessels, including battleships and landing craft, had been assembled and had sailed completely undetected. Now, as thousands of aircraft roared overhead to join in the assault, the ships began to bombard the shoreline, while the first of some 145,000 troops, along with their tanks and vehicles, made the final journey to gain a foothold on mainland Europe. D-Day, the first phase of Operation Overlord and the liberation of Europe, had begun. By the end of that fateful day, the Allied forces of the United States, Canada and Great Britain had gained the slenderest of toeholds on the continent. But they were there, and in the weeks that followed, they would gradually increase their strength to the point that the Germans could no longer contain them. The story of D-Day begins almost as soon as the British forces were chased off the continent in the spring of 1940. The German Blitzkrieg, launched on May the 10th, 1940, against the Low Countries and then France proved unstoppable. By the beginning of June, British and French troops were trapped in the Channel port of Dunkirk. Only a heroic effort directed by Admiral Bertram Ramsey prevented an ignominious retreat turning into the worst defeat in British history for a thousand years. Vessels of every size snatched groups of exhausted men off the beaches as the Germans closed in for the kill. Over 300,000 British and French troops were rescued, although they had been forced to leave all their equipment behind. But these men would form the core of a new, better equipped army that would one day fight their way back onto the continent. The planning for that fight back began within the year. Winston Churchill had become British Prime Minister following the evacuation of Dunkirk. Even during the country's most perilous moments during the Battle of Britain, he was determined that British forces would one day return to rid the continent of the Nazis. His vision was given a fresh impetus with the re-election of President Franklin D. Roosevelt of the United States. Although officially neutral, the war now took on a new dimension. In January 1941, the Lease Lend Bill was introduced into Congress, giving Britain access to America's massive industrial capability. Secret meetings were held by military staff from both sides. It was agreed that the defeat of Germany in Europe 
was to be given the priority. The offensive against Germany was to begin with the bombardment from the air. Land forces were to be built up and re-equipped so that an amphibious landing could be mounted somewhere on the north coast of France. But getting equipment to Britain meant running the gauntlet of the North Atlantic where the packs of U-boats waited. But as the convoys began to receive better cover from the air and on the sea, the tide began to turn in the Allies' favor. But following the talks in Washington, the war took a dramatic turn. Firstly, in June 1941, Germany invaded its former ally, Soviet Russia. Then, in December that year, Japan attacked the American Pacific Fleet at its home base at Pearl Harbor. This was followed by Hitler's extraordinary declaration of war against the United States. Although Roosevelt, Churchill and Stalin all agreed that Germany and Japan had to be beaten, there would be much dissent and argument as to how this end should be achieved. Stalin was eager that there should be a second front in Europe to relieve the pressure on his forces. The Americans also wanted a quick resolution in Europe so that they could turn their full attention to Japan. Churchill, on the other hand, wanted to continue the campaign in North Africa and then attack southern Italy, Europe's soft underbelly, as he described it. But he also recognized that it was important to keep the Russians in the war, and opening a second front on continental Europe was the only way that the pressure on the Soviets could be relieved. It was against this backdrop that Britain mounted its first amphibious operation in August 1942. The target was Dieppe. The raiding party was made up of Canadian units and the only recently formed commandos. The raid, codenamed Operation Jubilee, was only meant to be an experiment, but it turned out to be a monumental disaster. The crucial element of surprise was lost when the operation was postponed for a month giving German reconnaissance aircraft enough time to record the build-up of landing craft. Air cover was also patchy, as the RAF did not have air supremacy. Even worse, the tanks sank into the shingle as they came ashore, thus denying the infantry the heavy fire support they needed. But lessons were learned from the Dieppe fiasco, which would serve the Allies well planning for the landings in northern France. Three months later, in November 1942, the first Allied landing in North Africa took place. The landings coincided with a successful Russian counteroffensive, which forced the Germans onto a defensive footing for the first time. By May 1943, the Germans and their Italian allies had been defeated in North Africa. Victory in North Africa paved the way for the invasion of Sicily and then Italy. But these invasions, coupled with an increase of the bombing campaign against German industry, did little to placate an increasingly irate Stalin. Only the opening of a second front in Western Europe would divert sufficient resources from the East to relieve the pressure on the Soviets. In May 1943, the proposed invasion of Western Europe was given its name, Operation Overlord, and by January 1944, a Supreme Commander had been appointed, General Dwight D. Eisenhower. Eisenhower appointed British commanders to oversee the invasion forces on land, sea, and air. General Bernard Law Montgomery, the victor of El Alamein, was given command of the ground invasion forces. Admiral Bertram Ramsey, the hero of Dunkirk, was appointed naval commander. And Air Chief Marshal Trafford Lee Mallory was to be head of the expeditionary air forces. 
Although Normandy had already been chosen as the invasion site, one of Montgomery's first acts was to increase the size and scope of the invasion force. He demanded, and got, five divisions for the initial landing, and widened the area of the landings to include the Orne River estuary on the eastern flank and the base of the Cotentin Peninsula on the western flank. The invasion force was to consist of five infantry divisions, two American, two British, and one Canadian. They were to land on beaches codenamed West to East, Utah, Omaha, Gold, Juneau, and Sword. In addition, two American airborne divisions, the 82nd and 101st, were to drop behind the western end of the assault area, while one British division, the 6th, was to drop on objectives on the eastern end. As training intensified, the build-up of reserves of men and equipment continued to flow in from the United States. The convoy still had to run the gauntlet of the U-boat threat, even though the danger was not as great as it had been. In January 1944, there were some 750,000 American personnel in the UK. By D-Day, this would have swollen to one and a half million men and women. As the military personnel poured in, the British civilians became accustomed to the sight of men and women of many different nationalities on their streets. combat troops and aircraft have completely routed the attacking German army at the Ardennes front.
We gotta get these clothes off. So what now? I don't know. How's your German? German line's about a half mile up that way. This road will take you straight through the clearing. Our boys are dug in on the other side. You ready? Yeah, have you a little McDougal? Save some lives. That's the idea. Hey. I didn't sign up. I tried to dodge the draft. And my father came and found me. your big secret. <laughs> Did you get that one?
cover up those weapons. All right, Winley. Look sick. Kann man es nicht verpassen. Vielen Dank. Hey, warst du nicht mit mir in der Grundausbildung? Wie ja, heißt du nochmal? Was ist schon wieder? Kannst du ein Schieben helfen? Ja, klar. Hey, ihr beiden, fragt mal mit an. Ungeschickt. 
Dead eye. I don't know. I just couldn't hit him. Couldn't or wouldn't? Yeah, I did not miss on purpose. That's a lie. That's enough. Deacon says he just missed. He just missed him. We got other things to worry about right now. Oh. Look what I found. I had gunshots. So I started back through the woods and I found this little fuck out. Kneeling down, praying his little jerry head off. So we shoot him right now. Shut up, I'm with Kendrick. Shoot him with his own gun. Don't shoot prisoners, people. Yeah, but he does. Shoot him! Shut up! Come on with me! Shoot him! Will he? Put the gun down! <laughs> you will obey my orders! Will he? Has he ever seen on me? In the clear? In the clear? What's going on? In the clear? You want me to shoot you? Can you put this away? You need it. I'll just make it. Deacon! This is Rudolf Fitz from Berlin. When I was on my mission, I taught his family. Like. before me. I never missed. Gunny, I didn't hit him. So, Winley, why did you come back? I heard gunshots. I realized I was probably going to die out there. I'm not proud of it. You made a choice. You're still alive, that's good for you. Yes, that's true. Been that. Go, you're up. Wars happen for Shoot this way. Shoot this way to the moon. <laughs> what did he say his name was? Adolf. It uh, gives me creeps. It's Rudolph. Whatever. Hey, Winley. I'll make you a deal. You pick a card. Any card. Put it back in the deck. If I can find your car in this deck, you give me one of them smokes. What do you say?
Tatiana, my Russian piano teacher. <coughs> Tatiana, who's from Moscow, Russia, said to me a couple of weeks ago at Kiel University, where I have my piano lessons, Kiel University, Staffordshire, says, what's this, Tony? Bread, eggs, milk, newspaper, a bottle of wine. Oh, I said, well, Franz Liszt probably, when he wrote this music and played this piano as a majestic uh, piano piece um, he would have at it he would have uh, would have made a, a list of food well not Franz list well, he would have made a he would would have made out a, a note on his uh, music sheet to remind him to get some food and wine and um, uh, Tatiana is kind of rover. My piano teacher's got a master's degree. She just laughed. Just burst out laughing. <laughs> so there you go. That's why that's there. Uh, I explained to her. They had to eat and drink in those days. It's the same as any other time. 1850. This is 1851 when Francis composed this. 1851. About two years after. Frederick Chopin died. They were good friends, Franz Liszt and Frederick Chopin. Johannes Brahms, um, Chopin, Johannes Brahms, um, uh, Schumann, Robert Schumann, Clara Schumann, uh, Wagner. Uh, they're all good friends with one another. So they all knew one another in Paris, France. Franz Liszt is from Hungary. Spent most of his time in Germany and Weimar, and he spoke only German, though he's from Hungary. So, and as I said before, Frederick Chopin played for Queen Victoria in London. Um, it was 18, 18, 1847 when Frederick Chopin played for Queen Victoria. He went through Manchester, not far from where I live, and he went up and did, a, and did a concert in Edinburgh, Scotland as well, Chopin. But he took a toll on his health. And two years later he was dead. At the age of 39, I think he was, when he died. Chopin. He, he um, because Russia had, uh, had invaded Poland at that time, and apparently the concert, the European concert that he was to do, uh, Frederick Chopin was to raise money for the Polish people, which he succeeded in doing. But like I said, it, he ended up losing his life. One of the, the concert Contributing factors to him losing his life. Very sad. A great genius. But this is Franz Liszt, another great genius. <coughs> Not me, but Franz Liszt. <laughs> and um, I'm looking, as you know, I'm still working on this Mephisto Waltz, uh, number one, Dancing a Village Inn. Uh, 
and uh, I'm working on page 21 um, <coughs> And I'm doing right hand and left hand here. the second line. Oh. <coughs> Should have done a chord there. So second line. <coughs> That's what I'm working on. So this is the first using right hand only. I'm trying to keep my hand going uh, straight uh, <coughs> in a straight line rather than doing this. So, that's what Tatiana taught me. I wanted to build up my speed. I see a deep there.
the second line. <clears throat> So, first line. Line, top line, page 21, Francis Mephisto was. I should put it on the A yeah. No, see that. G sharp and G That's it from me from Tony Amore. Thank you very much. <laughs>